why are so many small business owners trying to be the bank for all their clients? It, it just blows my mind. You know, I, I tried to be when I first started, I was like, I couldn't do it. I mean, uh, there's no way I could do it. And so I, you have to come up with ways in order to do that. And that's why when we went to the, you know, weekly, weekly billing model, where you just simply flat feed and, and zapped everybody's account every Monday for the same dollar amount, clients loved it. Cause they, again, they didn't have to cut the checks and it was great for us. Cause we didn't have to go through all that issues and we got our money up front. You know, we didn't have, you know, there was, it eliminated so many business issues. Hey, it's the Profit Answer Man, Rocky Lalvani. If you're new to the podcast, check out my interview with Mike Michalowicz. It's episode number two. If you want to hear about each chapter in the Profit First book, go back and listen to episodes three through 13. Episode one is the why and how. On The Profit Answer Man, we learn money mastery without all the complicated accounting mumbo-jumbo using a simple system. Your accountant is busy documenting your transactions and creating a rearview mirror of what happened. My guess is you don't even look at the reports they sent you. If you're like most business owners, you struggle with this. And it's not your fault. We aren't taught money in school. And accountants aren't taught how to be profitable. The Profit First system created by Mike Michalowicz works, and he certified me to help you implement the system in your business. Remember, the new equation is sales minus profit equals expenses. Let's face it, without cash flow, you can't pay your employees, buy needed materials, or pay your mortgage and support your family. I help you to do that and more so you can focus on the parts of the business you love and receive the rewards for your labor and investment into your business. The stronger you are as a business owner, the more jobs you create, the better we are as a country. Small business owners are the backbone of America, and for that, you deserve to be well rewarded. Just remember, more revenue does not equal more profit. That's why we focus on the bottom line. Today, we have on another fractional CFO to share how he works with his clients. He's Jody Grunden from Summit CPA Group. They started back in 2002 as a fully distributed accounting firm. And in 2020, they merged, and now they are Summit Virtual CFOs by Anders. They provide the same services we do. Actually, they do a lot more than I do. They do bookkeeping and they do tax and accounting and and everything else, whereas I just do the CFO services. So God bless them for offering that full package. We're going to chat about how he helps companies grow, be more successful, have more cash and work less. Because at the end of the day, that is what we all want. He's going to share practical tips that you can implement in your business to take it to the next level. Let's meet Jody and learn from him. Welcome to the Profit Answer Man, Jody Grunden. It's great to have you join us today. Yeah, thanks. Uh, Thanks, Rocky. Thanks for having me on. Can you share a little bit about yourself and your business? Oh, yeah, absolutely. So I'm uh, five foot seven. (laughs) No, just joking. (laughs) Um, With that, I started a uh, firm in 2002 called the Summit CPA Group. And uh, with that, we uh, started a basically a, a program called Virtual CFO Services. And so it was something that was really new, new concept. No one was really doing it at that point. And uh, we thought, hey, let's do things a little differently. We wanted to change the way that people thought about accounting because uh, typically the accountants, I used to work for you know public accounting firms. I worked in the corporate world. They both looked at each other completely different. And, uh, and I didn't like either. And so it was one of those things that I was an, kind of an orphan, right? And so I realized pretty quickly that I was more of an entrepreneur than I was an accountant. So when I started this, I was like, hey, let's do everything differently from the way that we dressed to the way that we build clients, you know, get rid of the hourly bill thing and, and, and really create something that the client can walk away thinking, wow, that was valuable. You know, because we, we, we all know that when they get those financial statements, if they don't understand them, it just goes right in the drawer or doesn't even get printed or whatever that might be. And we wanted to make them jump to life for them so they could actually make some informative decisions and work forward. 
And so with that in mind, we, we just simply molded things as we went. We created a subscription-based billing model to where we zap their, the client's bank account every single week versus sending them an invoice and waiting for that to eliminate the, the cash flow issues that we might have personally as a company, but also nuisance for the client. You know, they didn't like cutting checks either. And so then we, we just kept doing things a little bit differently. In 2013, we went fully remote. You know, we had an 18-person office at, at that point, and we got rid of the, the brick and mortar. And we've been uh, fully remote for over 10 years, and that's been a great ride for us. Uh, we've grown, to, you know, grown it where we actually double our size every three years based on the on, on growth and revenue, and kept a very high profit margin doing so. And and I think as, as Rocky, as you and I both know, revenue is important, but profit margin is even more important. And so that was a, a big staple we had to do. We had to grow profitably, and we did that, doubled our size until we got to about uh, 10 million dollars in revenue. Uh, then we actually merged with a large accounting firm, a top 100 accounting firm. And now we are uh, basically tasked to grow at 5X. We're going to get to that $50 million mark by uh, then the end of 2026. We're definitely on our way to doing that and tracking really well and uh, profit margin as well. So we're, we're pretty excited about the whole thing. And so that kind of gives you the scoop then. So 20 years ago, started a CFO practice. Nobody knew what that even meant. The word wasn't even used in the ether there. We uh, marketed through content marketing. We don't. We didn't actually have to knock on doors or anything. We did all of our marketing through content marketing, drove it through the website. And that's how we drove our clients, which was a different concept back then. If you remember, we used to have a, a um, shoot a phone book, Yellow Pages, and you advertise in the Yellow Pages. I didn't have the money to do that. So that's why I went the web, <laughs> you know, and we just kind of did a lot of things differently. And, and with, again, the idea of changing the way people think about accounting. And I think we've done a pretty decent job. Uh, if you look at really anybody's websites nowadays, they have some sort of virtual CFO, you know, marked on their websites as an accounting firm. And uh, it's kind of neat to say that uh, we are one of the first people or, or the pioneers of doing that. And I think you are correct. Most business owners, probably 80% of them don't look at their financials if they even get them at all. And that is just the honest to God truth. Of those that do, three quarters of them don't know what to do with them. Like, okay, I see this. All right. But now what? And I Mm -hmm. think that is the biggest factor is taking the financials and turning them into the next action step of how do you predict, manage, and move forward into the future. Mm -hmm. So out of curiosity, when you say virtual CFO services, like what does that mean to a business owner? Like they hear this, but Mm -hmm. what do you actually do for me as a business owner? That's a great question. Uh, Because back then it was pretty easy because we, when we we created it, well, we decided what it was going to be. (laughs) And uh, we thought it was going to be advisory, you know, say we're going to meet with you on a regular monthly basis and we're going to take those financial statements and we're going to flip them to a forecast and really kind of help you shape the future. You know, we're going to base that forecast not on percentages and all that kind of stuff, but really non-financial indicators that you actually have control over. So like I use the example a lot that if you are a trucking company, that maybe truck repair company, and you've got 10 trucks coming in at $100 a truck, or let's say $1,000 a truck, and you've got an inventory of 10 trucks. Uh, well, next month we're talking, if you only had eight trucks come through, that's going to really hit the forecast. We got to make some changes going forward. And is that going to be a consistent thing or is that a one-off thing? You know, are you going to have more trucks next month because you didn't have, you didn't get as many done because your inventory is bigger. All those things we could actually talk with a client and put it into their terms to really kind of help them make that, those informed decisions. So when you ask, what does a virtual CFO do? That's what we consider. We, we consider it that strategy part, you know, they can really get in there on a weekly basis and be part of the leadership team and help them make, you know, informed decisions, whether it's hiring or firing or increasing prices, you know, holiday, you know, basically util, you know, for utilization, you know, what does a holiday do to your bottom line? People think it's free. It's not really free because it costs you money and costs time and they can't do, you know, so there's a lot of things in there that people just automatically make these assumptions and we help those business owners really make the informed decision. Now, a third of our clients, we actually do do the accounting for the bookkeeping, pay bills and stuff like that. Uh, but uh, 70% of our clients, they already have that on staff and we're just simply helping guide the guide the ship. It sounds very similar to what I do. I mean, the big part of the decision making is, OK, you know, how many days a week do we need to stay open? Does it make sense to close some more? 
The biggest one is one that you touched on, which is pricing, because I think mm -hmm. a lot of times there is no thought given to pricing <laughs> no. at all. And <laughs> there not. is a whole psychology to pricing. There's also making sure that what you're selling is actually profitable and covering your overhead, because if it's not, maybe we shouldn't be selling stuff just to sell stuff. You know, Rocky, it's kind of funny you mention that because I'm sure you've been in client meetings before where they, you're looking at their margins, their margins are shrinking, shrinking, shrinking. And you're like, well, hey, we got to increase the price. And they're like, what do you, we can't do that. Clients will never pay for it. It's like, well, you either got to do that or go out of business, you know, your call. <laughs> and, you know, then you, then you'll plug in the model, you know, hey, if you just increase it by this percentage, you know, are you going to lose any clients? If you lose one or two, that's fine. If you're going to lose all of them, well, that might be a problem. Uh, but you just show them that and then their margins come right back into, into play. You know what we do? We raise prices on our worst clients. Oh, there you because go. Because mm -hmm. even if they leave, so what? And mm -hmm. we tested it. And if they stay, well, at least we're getting paid for their, you know. Mm -hmm. for and their then, and then if it works, <laughs> then you can start raising it on everybody else, right? Selective yeah. price increases. And Love it. Trying mm -hmm. it out and, and seeing how it uh how it flows. I will say I have noticed a lot more people saying they offer CFO services, mm -hmm. but I know CPAs and mm -hmm. I, I, I don't know. You've probably got a lot more experience with this, especially mm -hmm. with the, the size you've grown to. Can most of them deliver CFO services like we do? The answer is no. And if you were to go to, and I talk at a lot of different uh, CPA events and conferences, and on many different, uh, you know, advisory boards and so forth. And and when I say that, hey, we provide virtual CFO services, a lot of them will say, oh, we do too. I'm like, oh, wow, that's great. So what, what do you do for the client? And they, and they all fall back to accounting. You know, they do payables, receivables. They close the books. They maybe help them with their profit margins or whatever, but they don't go any further than that. And, uh, you know, with that, that to me is not CFO services. That to me is just simply a, a accounting advisory services, you know, client accounting, whatever you want to call it. Uh, but what you and I do, we're that step above. You know, we, we're actually meeting with them and going through it because you'll find that most accountants can't advise very well. They, they can't advise. They they always want to fall back to accounting. And, and I'm sorry, but clients do not understand accounting and they don't want anything to do with accounting. They just assume it's being done. They would love to get rid of it completely if they could and uh, just simply have somebody sit, sit with them on a regular basis, ask questions and, and really kind of help them guide the ship. And that's that, that's kind of what uh, both you and I do. And, and that's what clients look for. And that's it. It's seeing the future and helping you get from where you are today to where you want to be and mm -hmm. to pivot when you hit a storm, because we will all hit storms. And so how do we get through the storm and how do we pivot our way through it? Mm -hmm. What do you find are the most important financial metrics to help people grow their business? Yeah, the four we do at cash, production, financial, and then your pipeline metrics. Those are kind of the four. The most, and really neither one of them is more important than the other. And, and what I mean by that, it's like, for instance, your cash metric. Uh, we tell clients that they need to have between 10 to 30% of their annualized revenue in the bank at all times. So if they're a million dollar company, they should have 100 grand in the bank in, between a checking account and an operating account, making money and so forth. And in addition to that, they should have about 40% of their forecasted net income put in the bank throughout the year, you know, in a separate bank account, out of sight, out of mind, we call it a tax account, you know, so, so cash is super important. And, and, and the reason I say that 10% equals to equals about two months of expenses for a service-based company, 30%, six months. So between two to six months, we say 10 to 20 or 10 to 30% because most business owners can do the math pretty quickly. You know, if I'm a $6 million company, well, I should have 600,000. I only have 300,000. Oops. You know, what, what, what's wrong with that? And so, you know, we we always tell them never just keep it in their checking account. It's got to be set aside in a money market account or, you know, it's part of it, in a, a, you know, something that it's very liquid. Because what happens is people drive decisions based upon the cash they've got in the bank. And uh, if people say, no, we don't. Yeah, you always do. I mean, because how I'm going to advise you is going to be based on how much cash you have in the bank. And, 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 and the question is, well, what do you mean by that? And it's like, well, so let's say that you've got this, let's say you've got this opportunity to hire this business development person. This person is the best person in your field, all-star person, great. This is going to help your business dramatically. 
if and if you came to me and said, hey, Jody, should I should I hire this person? The first thing I'm going to look at is, well, how much cash do you have in the bank? Oh, you get zero cash. Let's say you got $100,000, but your line of credit's 1000 You are maybe $100,000 on your line of credit. It's like, well, you got no cash. You can't take the risk that's needed, unfortunately, to, to, buy the, to hire this person. You come to me in this, with the opposite situation where you've got 10% or 20% of your annualized revenue sitting in the bank. It's earning money. You come to me and they got this great business development person. I'm going to tell you absolutely jump all over that person if you think that's the uh, that's going to really help you out. And so the same person, different situations, how much cash you had in the bank. And that really goes for a lot of the financial decisions that uh, can be played. And cash is, is, is definitely the driving force of that. And it very much is. I think that's kind of the secret power of Profit First is it's literally a cash based system that takes your cash, puts it into piles for a specific purpose. And I've always explained it like the candy chart. You know, when when you got the candy chart and you're sitting in front of the TV or the the bag of potato chips, you're going to eat it all. Uh, at least I know <laughs> I will. Yeah. But if you have a smaller bag of potato chips, you'll just eat the smaller bag. And so if we constrain your bank account for spending, mm-hmm. you'll figure out how to live within that constraint and you'll be happy. The more money business owners see – the more tempted they are to spend and follow shiny objects and the faster that cash tends to disappear. Yep. hundred percent agree. And so that's why I always tell them if they got more than the 10 or 20 or 15%, whatever the risk tolerance is, get it out of your bank account, put it in your personal account. It's really much harder for you to put it back in the bank and the business at that point anyways, especially if you have a significant other or spouse, you know, they're, they're going to wonder why you're pulling money out <laughs> and putting it into the, uh, to the business. <laughs> But that also helps you if, because life changes, the world changes, right? Uh, Mm -hmm. Technology changes. If something happens to your business or to your health or anything else, you at least have another stream of income or source of income outside of the business. And you can go do real estate. You can buy another business. You can guide. There's a million things you can do with this money, but it's better to have multiple streams than everything in one particular place place. hundred percent agree. So what were the other factors that you had mentioned? Oh, so the, yeah, the other factors are your, are your production factors. And that's really kind of broken down company by company. And so if you're a service-based company, oftentimes it's, you know, a number of employees, it's the utilization that, of your team that's, you know, working on things, it's your average bill rate, um, you know, many different factors that belong into that. And, and, and Or if it's a trucking, like if it's that trucking company, it's the average truck. It's really what you're going to build your revenue on. And so the production metrics are always based, a revenue-based system. And that's really what, what's helping you create that forecast. And so what that means is that you actually want to go month by month and figure out exactly what the production is going to be in that month. If it's if it's a, basically if it's a, a service based company, you're taking holidays and that sort of thing out. You know, what, what do you expect your team to work if it's a multiple team person? You know, what's the bill of ours? If they don't bill by the hour, what are the contracts looking like coming in? How big are the contracts? And, and so basically the production metrics, I always say, is super in, is super dependent upon your industry and what you're doing. But what it does, it allows you to create that forecast because ultimately all the metrics should revolve around a forecast. You're looking at your balance sheet for the cash, and that's in your forecast. You should know what your, your cash position is throughout the entire year, two years, three years, based on non-financials. The production metrics are the ones that you're actually dialing in for the revenue. And then the next metrics would be your financial statement metrics, which kind of like your budget metrics. You know what? What does it take to operate this company marketing wise, operations wise, and your facility costs? So you're looking through and you're, you're breaking all the your financial metrics are. And there's a lot of places that you can look out to make sure that, hey, this is uh, basically this is in, in comparison to where you're at compared to industry averages and so forth. And so the financial metrics are going to kind of bring you back home and saying, you know, hey, if, if we're looking at we want to develop a 15 percent bottom line, we're always starting at that number first and we're kind of building back into it. So what do I have to cut out of my my pie in order to get it? And that's kind of what the uh, where the financial metrics are, are dialing in at. And then the uh, final metrics would be your pipeline metrics. Again, that varies company by company, industry by industry. But for the most part, those metrics are going to shore up your forecast. So you just created this really cool forecast. Here's how much cash you're going to have in the bank throughout. You've got your revenue all dialed in there. So you've got, you know, all, you know, each month, how much revenue that you're going to bring in based on what your team's capacity is. 
you got your financials, your financial part of it built into there. So you get you're creating that getting that forecast to budget there, and then your pipeline shores it up. And so looking over the next three months, where are we at? Now I can't substantiate that capacity, so I got to increase my next two months revenue because my pipeline's burst at the seams or the opposite. I have no pipeline. I've got to reduce it. And so how does that impact uh, the forecast going forward? So those four metrics are really the, they're, they're specific by specific, specific industry by industry, but you've got to identify really what drives your revenue. Super easy. Everybody should know what drives your revenue and, and you build your forecast on that. If you don't know, give Rocky a buzz. He'll help you out. You'd be surprised at how many people don't know why their clients buy from them. I will tell you the one thing that I think has been very enlightening to a lot of my customers is utilization. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter what the industry is. If you've got people who you are billing out, whether you're in, you know, therapists or the trades mm -hmm. or anything else is number one, do you know how many hours of the day they're actually working. And by working, I mean in front of a client billing right. versus how many they're not. Mm -hmm. And do you make that public? Right. And I we have just found if we just capture that information and just put it up, we don't even have to talk about it. Like once people start seeing their utilization numbers in a comparison, nobody wants to be at the bottom of the chart. So everybody right. just starts working a little bit more just by sharing. You nailed down the head because we, we've we done that from the very beginning, you know, because people are you the person that has to see something before you do it or do you do it before you see it? I see it and then I do it. You know, I, I'm the person that can do it without actually seeing it actually being done. But there's a lot of people that aren't that way. And so what, what you're talking about works exactly for everything, really. You know, we tell our CFOs, hey, you've got to manage a book of business of 20 people, and that's going to generate on the high end, probably a $2 million book of business, you know, and and then when a, when a new CFO comes in and they're struggling like crazy at five people, they're like, I don't know how many, how, how could you do 20 people? There's no way. And then all of a sudden they see everybody's names posted up there. Oh, Kristen's got 20 people. <laughs> You know, Tom's got 18 and no one's even clear. It's like, oh, wow, I guess we can do that. And it's the same thing that uh, it's it's a mind thing, really. It's I don't because I don't know if it's a, a lazy thing versus a, a real busy thing. I think it's a a mindset. You know, hey, I don't really know what my expectations are. And then when they see other people doing it, then they can actually figure out ways in order to get to that. And I think that's a big part of it. In a lot of companies, everyone's real busy. Mm -hmm. But nobody's doing anything. <laughs> right. Right. They're just running around lighting fires to put out and they're not actually getting the work done or they don't have good systems and processes in place to be able to do things quickly, efficiently and easily. And and I think that's the big part of the problem. Mm -hmm. People are just wasting time, so to speak, instead of um it's called Parkinson's law. And what, what, what that states is that states that uh, the more that you have available and more you're doing, the more efficient you get doing it. And what I mean by that, and kind of getting back to what I just mentioned there earlier, if I've got two clients and I'm working 40 hours a week, I find ways to stay busy. I'm busier than heck. I'm not not busy. I'm busier than heck. I'm working on those clients. But if I, if I had two more clients to that, that doesn't mean I'm working 80 hours a week. It means I'm still working 40, but I'm figuring more ways to be efficient with it. And, the, and it, it continues on to where you got that 20 clients that I mentioned. I'm still working 40, basically becoming super efficient. I know what to do myself. I know what to delegate. I know what kind of software is going to help me achieve things better. I know how to manage my time more effectively now, my calendar, or whatever that might be. Whereas... When I didn't have all that, it didn't make any difference. I didn't need a, a, a solid calendar. I didn't need to use the best tools. I didn't need to use any of that because I, I didn't have as much to do. And, but again, the more people do and more people work, I, I think the better they, more efficient they become. And that is very true. Parkinson's law is the underlying theme of Profit First. It is okay. what it's designed. It's, it's basically, if we constrain your money, then you'll figure out essentially the same thing. If we constrain your time, you'll figure out how to be more efficient with your time and your money. And once you get that down, it is, it really comes down to, to the simplicity of it. And for example, like I will never leave a client meeting without booking the next meeting. 
Oh, for sure. Right. Because I don't want to waste time trying to follow up, pick a time, play games. It's just much easier. It's just like you. I don't waste time doing billing and all of that stuff is automated, set, auto draft, like everything just happens. I spend zero time on it. It just happens. And I don't think people realize how efficient you can get if you think through it before. So I was going to hire somebody to go through my email because it was Mm -hmm. driving me crazy. I get over 100 emails a day. Yep. And then I started looking at my emails. I go, wait a minute. These are all crap emails. Why am I paying somebody to look at the crap emails? Then I, I found a solution to that, that it automatically sorts my emails, only the ones that I want to see. Yep. And the surprise emails come into my email box. So like a new new potential person would show up my email box. Stuff that I don't want to read regularly just gets pushed off. And so I'm also not distracted. Yep. Right? I'm not, oh my God, I got six emails. I got to go through and make decisions on these. They, they don't show up. Mm-hmm. So I don't have to make decisions. So I don't. That's great. Because I mean, a lot of people, distractions cause us to be inefficient. And if you can eliminate those, like you've done with that, with emails, that's great. You know, one, one that I've actually done also is my calendar. You know, I don't typically take phone calls or schedule, try to schedule appointments with people and go back and forth with emails. I send them a calendar link and they just pop on my calendar and do that. And it's kind of funny because you would think, well, that's pretty common sense. Everybody should do that. And I'll, I'll bet you there's probably nine out of 10 people that are like, well, people can get on your calendar. Well, what, what if I don't want them on my calendar? And it's like, <laughs> you know, it's like, well, then you set parameters. <laughs> you know, here's when they can schedule times or, you know, it, it's, it's, it's amazing how people will automatically go to the negative all the time and why things won't work versus, Hey, let's figure out a way that we can make this work where I don't have to spend time back and forth with, with somebody. And then eventually everybody's mad at each other because it's taken us five emails <laughs> and uh, we're finally on, on the calendar together. You know, why not just give them the power to pop right on the calendar, set the parameters and, and you're good. And there's obviously tons of software that will do that nowadays. And there's a link in the show notes here. You can get on my calendar if you want to do business with us. (laughs) There you go. (laughs) I make it simple, right? There you go. Yep. That was literally turning on the automated calendar was a a big time saver. And I have, so I also use something called Text Expander. And basically what it does is it allows me to have a couple of keystrokes that allow me to do everything. So for example, You went through an agency to book today, but when they sent me that email, I just was like, I know this guy, I want him on the podcast. And I did a a keystroke, which was ZE, ZE, because it's Z email. And it's like, you know, PG podcast guest. And it immediately says, Hey, I'd love to see Jody on the thing. Here's the (laughs) link. Send me the bio, send me the headshot. Here's all the information. Here's how the interview is going to take place. That was four letters. Right? Nice. And then then you or the, the agency then go in my calendar. They find a time. And now that calendar is limited. These mm-hmm. are the time slots where I will record yep. podcasts. Yep. And all the things. And it won't let you book too early. And it'll let you go out. And, mm-hmm. and then it sends reminders so that you've got reminders. and It sends reminders. Whether it's text or email. Yep. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And everything mm-hmm. just gets done. And so all of that came down to hitting four letters on a keyboard. Now, it took me time to build it, to process it, to put the systems in. But throughout your day, I do that millions of times throughout the day for even something as simple as entering in stuff on forms. It's all programmed or I can do keystrokes, even down to the credit card and passwords and everything. So it just keep it simple. And yeah. and that's the biggest thing. I think because you can't see, I can look at your P&L and say you're losing money, but I there's no measurement of efficiency. Mm-hmm. And so it's knowing, hey, let's sit down and talk about your entire process from the moment you try to get a customer, whatever that is, to the moment you actually get your cash. And what are all the steps? How do we walk through them? Where can we remove friction? Because every time there's friction, it's costing you time and money. And most people don't even test their own systems. 
most people don't even know they have a system. Oh, well, there's, I see, I'm a system, like everything, every problem has a system as a solution. Mm-hmm. Well, that's and, the only way you can scale. You can't scale without having processes. I mean, no. Emeth was a great, uh, great book that I read. You know, before I even started the business, so it's like I need something that's repeatable processes. And, and this, that's what we're talking about right now is exactly that. It's it's exactly you know creating that ability to actually scale by pro- providing other folks with that with the same process. You know, that process minimization, or what we call that maximization. You know, from person to person and. Uh, you know, it, it's hugely important. And creating checklists for everyone in your organization so everything follows through. I mean, I if I, a lot of the things, some of the things I do, I don't do every day. Like I batch all these podcasts when I, when I have to go do through my stuff. I'm like, what am I supposed to do? And then I spend 10 minutes thinking. But when I have a checklist, I go, oh, I got to do this. Click, and then, then it starts to pop and I'm like, click, 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 click. And everything gets done, and I'm no longer thinking about what I have to do. I just do what I have to do, especially for those in the service industry. Like if you're doing hourly billing and you're not billing and you're not making sure your invoices are out, you're losing money left and right. Oh, and and that's kind of funny you mentioned that because they uh, that's probably the biggest. I, I would say for most lawyers, accountants, all the right they've got to do just because they didn't get a timely bill out. You know, even <laughs> plumbers. Plumbers, like the plumber yeah. comes if he doesn't if you don't have a bill or a credit card right then and there now you have to go back and let's face it i mm-hmm. you know everybody hates doing this including the plumber and so mm-hmm. it becomes last on the list and i'm like how are you running your business not getting paid for four months like that's yeah. absurd oh yeah yeah the uh especially with technology now i mean i i, I think personally I think invoices should be just kind of go away you know, they, they should be banned. They should be, you know, hey, pay on demand. You know, you provide a service, boom, you know, there should be a way to get that money, you know, right away. You know, because why are so many small business owners trying to be the bank for all their clients? It, it just blows my mind. You know, I, I tried to be when I first started. I was like, I couldn't do it. I mean, there's no way I could do it. And so I, you had to come up with ways in order to do that. And that's why when we went to the, you know, weekly weekly billing model, where you just simply flat feed and, and zapped everybody's account every Monday, for the same dollar amount, clients loved it because, they, again, they didn't have to cut the checks. And it was great for us because we didn't have to go through all that issues. And we got our money up front. You know, we didn't have – you know, there was – it eliminated so many business issues. And it also eliminated having a ton of administrative people. We didn't need tons of people to track my time and put it into a system and send invoices out and collect on them. All that was completely wiped away just for the simple fact that, hey – you know, client just automatically create your create your message, create the way that you do business by getting payment up front. Plumbers, electricians, there is no reason that they should not get paid on every job they go to at the job. Maybe half of it before they get there, and then the other just to make sure that it's legitimate, and then the other half when they get when they show up and get the work done. I mean, that's just kind of how the the society has has come with technology. That the only reason that you don't do it is because you're afraid to do it. And, uh, you know, you got to get over that. You got to get over that fear. Yeah, because for an electrician, they could say up front, hey, you know, it's a ninety five dollar service charge. Let me grab your credit card. Once they put the credit card in, they're done. They just look at the guy, go, hey, everything's done. This is what the bill came to. You good with that? Click here. Have a nice day. Emailed receipt. (laughs) Like. And the money's in your bank. Yeah, done. Yeah. Mm hmm. It's it's building out and creating those systems and processes to uh, to make it simple. And, mm-hmm. and unfortunately, a lot of people don't. One of the other things I really like to focus on, though, is tracking the forward looking of sales. And what I mean by that is analyzing what has to happen first for the sale to begin. So it it is it could be somebody comes to your website. They fill out a form, they pick up the phone, they walk in your front door. Are you tracking all of that? And do you look at it month to month so that, because usually by the time we notice a slowdown is when there's no cash in the bank. (laughs) And I'd much rather say, hey, let's look at your business from the front end so that I can tell you that you're good for the next couple. Like I've got some larger builders and stuff. And for them, it's like, we can now sit down and go, hey, thumbs up. You're cool for the next five months. Your cash flow is fine. We've actually laid out 
when the money is coming in, buy property, and they see what's going on, and it gives them peace of mind. Yeah, and I think by tracking that to the to the detail that you're, you're you just outlined there, and, and tracking it, but not only tracking it, but actually following up on it, will will uncover things that you may not realize is happening. And what I mean by that is, um, had a client that's spending a ton in marketing. You know, let's say it's about probably seven to ten percent of their annualized revenue in marketing. So they're spending a lot of money there. And just this year, they're seeing their sales record sales more sales than they've ever had. And so you're thinking, wow, that, that marketing spend is really generating a ton of money. And so when we looked into it, it's like, well, mo- majority of those clients came from a few referral sources that you didn't need to spend a dime to get. And the, the, uh, these other referrals can be you know, g- earmarked towards different engagements that they were in that we've got identified exactly the dollar amount they spent. And then the difference that you thought was driving all this revenue, actually, we only got two or three clients from. And it's like, you realize you just spent 10% of your annualized revenue to get two or three clients. But had you not looked at it, had you not stepped back and looked at it, you would have thought for sure that money was well spent because their client closings went up. And so looking at that, I think it's super important to analyze that because you you never know where you're spending your money and what's really working until you actually look at it. And you have to measure it. And I know this really sounds complicated. It's actually not. Most of this stuff is pretty simple to do once you have systems in place. And my clients don't take very much time doing this. Sometimes it's all automated. It just happens automatically. We just have to grab the data, which is perfectly fine, too. Um, You just have to build out the systems and processes to do it. Is there anything we should have talked about today that we didn't get a chance to? No, I don't think so. I mean, we talked about cash, which I think, again, is the number one thing uh, that every business owner should know. And uh, we went all the way from there and and we uh, focused on, you know, basically how to create a forecast. And the forecast being the the driving force of all strategy. You know, whether you do it yourself or have somebody else help help you, I think it absolutely has to happen. And a forecast should just simply not be income, but it should be tied to your your bank balances. It should You should know exactly what the cash position all the way throughout. And then we wrapped it up with uh, the marketing metrics, you know, what, what you're looking for and the importance of actually dialing in and knowing you know, everything. So, I, I, Rocky, I think we covered uh, just about everything. Well, that's good to hear. We did it in a quick amount of time. This stuff isn't that complicated when you know what you're doing and when you set it up and, and you do it. And, you know, my goal is to help people. If you want to do it yourself, do it yourself. If you need help, you've got uh, Jody, you've got me. we got people out there who will help you thrive and grow your business. If people would like to learn more about you, find out about your services, how do they do that? Yeah, probably just hopping on my website. It's probably the easiest way. It's uh, summitcpa.net. Make sure you use the .net. Rocky made the mistake of doing the .com. I couldn't afford it at the time, so I went .net. So S-U-M-M-I-T-C-P-A.net. Oh, or just uh, you can follow me on LinkedIn. I've got or just even Google my name. You'll see a ton of uh, content out there uh, regarding that. Uh, so pretty easy to find. Uh, and uh, and I'm available, obviously, through a calendar link. So I'm going to rock you on uh, hopping on my calendar anytime and, and for a meeting. Thank you so much for joining us today. Yeah, thank you. I hope you enjoyed the conversation as much as I did. Here's the reality. While I'm bringing on someone who does the same thing as I do to share with you, I'm also learning from them, especially before and after we hit record about how I can improve my services as well. We all are pretty friendly in this industry. We all help each other grow. And at the end of the day, we do this because of you, because we want you to have that. So the reality is cash flow is going to be what drives your business decisions. Do you have the cash to be able to do what you want? Are you creating good forecasts? Do you know what you're expecting to happen? And do you measure against that? Do you know how your sales cycles work? Do you know where the efficiencies and inefficiencies are? You have checklists and processes in place. And I love the whole thing. You know what? You raise prices on your worst clients first to see what happens because you're happy if they leave. The good news is, I don't have bad clients. I get rid of them before they show up. And that's the easy way. The other thing is figure out how to get paid quickly. The faster, the better. That really helps you to improve your cash flow. 
love to hear what was most impactful for you. Remember, this all ties back to what we say. You don't need more resources. You need to be more resourceful and focus on the bottom line. If you'd like for us to be a part of your profitability journey, we have different programs available ranging from do-it-yourself to one-on-one coaching. Our course, The Profit Blueprint, teaches you everything you need to know to transform your profitability. There are three different tiers ranging from DIY to done with you so that businesses of all sizes can get the support that's best. Join the waitlist in the show notes to get more information and be a part of the next cohort. If you want a done for you service, you can hire us as your chief profitability officers. We only work with a handful of clients so they all get our full attention. We work with business owners who have or are growing to half a million to 10 million in revenue. You can use the scheduling link in the show notes to get on our calendar for a good fit conversation to see if we're the right people to support you and how we can help you. This episode of the Profit Answer Man podcast is brought to you by smbpodcastnetwork.com. The network is a collection of podcasts and shows from around the internet, which focus on bringing you interviews with amazing guests who share actionable advice, ideas, and information for small and and medium-sized business owners and entrepreneurs. Visit www.smbpodcastnetwork.com to find more great shows and easily subscribe to be notified of new episodes. It's a great way to discover quality content. If you've discovered us via the network, then I hope you enjoy today's show and will consider subscribing directly so you never miss our episodes. Remember to check out my other podcast, Richer Soul, where we talk about how to live the ultimate life and be the best business owner you can be. As we close out, let's repeat the mantra. Revenue is vanity, profit is sanity, and cash is king. Have an abundant and profitable week.